Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Before we begin, since this is Aunt Bethany's 80th Christmas, I think she should lead us in the saying of grace. Oh, great. Oh. What, dear? Grace! Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. They want you to say grace. The blessing! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. 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 Why don't we welcome our Facebook folks that has joined us today in our e-text crowd. Would y'all give them a big hand right now as they're watching? <laughs> I, I love that we get to do that with technology, that people can join us on Facebook Live and then on e-text. Uh, we show that on uh, channel 999. Uh, if you get to watch that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, if you miss. Uh, but as you know, this morning we're talking about prayer. And I don't know if your family looks like that uh, or not. Maybe you've said the Pledge of Allegiance over the turkey. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be careful because my family, most of my family lives in Diana. And uh, they have e-text cables. So I don't want to say anything about my family because they may watch it on TV. Anyway, um... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, when we think about prayer and we think about that, sometimes it's kind of awkward, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what you think about when you think about prayer. Maybe you think about, man, I get to pray. And maybe some of you in this room don't get near as excited about prayer like that. Maybe some of you in this room, when you hear the word prayer, you go, yeah, it's a good thing. It's all right. Maybe you're in your mind this morning, you're going, well, honestly, my prayer life is pretty dead gum stagnant right now. Or, or let me just be honest, it's void. In fact, the last time I prayed, I was in trouble and I hadn't thought about it since. <laughs> I grew up in a, a, a particular group and, and I used to go to that Wednesday night prayer meeting. Y'all, did y'all have those growing up? And I would go to those prayer meetings thinking they were gonna pray and they didn't. For 45 minutes, they would talk about what they needed to pray about, but yet they'd never get around to praying. You ever been to one of those? And so I thought that was prayer, you know, growing up. And, and then I learned later that prayer was more. And, and, you know, there was a season in my life, and maybe you're this way too. Maybe you think prayer is only for the old ladies in the church that just get together and they have nothing else to do. And that's what they do is they pray. Or maybe the super spiritual. I remember I grew up with a guy, and he's much older than I am. And he, he's gone on to be at the Lord now. And his name was Les Stagner. Les could pray heaven down. I'm telling you, the guy was phenomenal. I loved him. I loved being around him. But, you know, for some of you, you think that prayer is maybe for guys like like me or guys like that. Maybe it's your backup plan. Maybe you never think about it until you're getting that wreck or you have that test and you got that test coming up and you know it's going to happen and, and you might throw up a prayer at the last minute. Maybe it's unrealistic for some of you. I realize for some of you, this is the first time you've been in church in a long time and, and you know you should pray, but you really don't know what it looks like. And it's maybe a little bit difficult and it's empty because I think we all have these perceptions. In fact, some of us have this perception. I've been around these guys that think the louder you pray and the more you yell at God and talk in King James. God will hear more. It's like God's had a kind of hard of hearing. 
I don't know if I want to serve a God that's hard of hearing, amen? But some of us kind of live in that whole world that we got to yell at God and talk a certain language. And maybe you're like me, you've been in a place and I, I, I've been there where it seems like everything you pray, it's like it's bouncing off the ceiling. It's like nothing's happening and God's not responding, dead silence. I've had those times where I just wonder, God, why, where are you and why aren't you speaking? Maybe I'm the only one, maybe you've been there, maybe you're there now where it seems like nothing is happening. And I came from this background that if God was being silent, your prayers are only making it to the ceiling and you have sin in your life. And I grew up thinking, oh man, I got sin. As I grew older and I started examining my life and I started looking at my heart and, and those seasons where I wasn't hearing anything from God and I wasn't seeing God move at all. And I would look at my own journey and I was like, I couldn't find any really open sin. I couldn't find the big ones, you know, because we all know the big ones, right? And, and I couldn't find those. And it just, it's like, man, what's going on? I was reading Henry Blackaby years ago and he, he talked about this very thing. And he took us back to John chapter 11. And you remember that story, if you've been in church, if you haven't been in church, it was when Jesus' best friend died. His name was Lazarus. And they sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. And Jesus did something incredible. Is he waited three days. <laughs> and then he shows up and Lazarus' sisters, they are ticked off. They're like, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. It's your fault, why did you wait? And what's incredible about the story is Jesus looked at those sisters and said, I can heal your brother. And we say, they said, Jesus, we know that. And here's where it gets ready. See, I think Jesus delayed, and this is what Blackaby was writing about. I think Jesus delayed because he was getting ready for a greater revelation of himself for those sisters. For those sisters to see something deeper and greater about the Savior, because they knew Jesus could, but what Jesus was fixing to do, he, they knew the truth, they knew who, what he could do, but they were about to experience him in a whole different way. You see, heaven doesn't close because God's punishing you. Some of you have this idea that God's punishing you and that's why he doesn't answer you. Can I just say this? God poured out all of his wrath on Jesus when Jesus died on the cross. And all the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus so that you and I could be made right through Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. And so God doesn't shut down heaven when you and I sin. Isn't that good? God doesn't shut down heaven. And he really wants us to come and visit with him and have him. And I gotta be honest with you, when God is silent, I still go through my checklist and I still check out my heart because what we said last week, what, what goes on in the heart matters. And so I'll still go through my heart, but when I go through that checklist and I go through that inventory and I realize there's no big open sin that I need to deal with, then I get ready because I know God's getting ready to do something big. And he's beginning to give me a revelation of himself. And all of a sudden, concern goes to anticipation. And I go, man, God's on it. It must be fixing good. It's fixing to happen. You see, when you look at scripture and you see the boldness of Moses, the faith of Elijah who called down fire from heaven, wouldn't that be fun? Oh, come on, you bunch of religious people. Wouldn't that be fun? I mean, wouldn't you just love to call down fire? And you got someone in mind you'd like to call it down on, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you know how it is. I mean, that's one of my favorite, I mean, we were in Israel. I couldn't wait to go to that place where Elijah called down fire at Mount Carmel and then it was foggy and I couldn't see anything. But anyway, I just, I love that story. I look at the passion of Ezra, the transparency of David who committed adultery, man, murdered. And just the honesty and the transparency it was declared to him, a man after God's own heart, that unwavering, unwavering nature of Daniel to stand and to not compromise the trust of Zacharias praying for his wife who was barren and that faith to trust God. And then that grip that Peter had when he was filled with the Holy Spirit on prayer and calling on God. And, and then how could we forget Paul? But probably the, the, the biggest one of all, and I want you to think about this morning, when it comes to prayer, that Jesus was a man of prayer. Now think about that. Jesus, the son of God, was a man of prayer. I mean, he could do anything he wanted to. I mean, if he wanted to call down fire on you right now, he could. And yet Jesus, in the 33 years that he walked the earth, in the three years of his ministry, we learned so much about what it means to depend on the father from him, who when Jesus said, I do nothing unless the father tells me, 
And very early in the morning, while it was still dark, a regular practice of Jesus, that Jesus went out and he spent time with, with the Father of listening. And here's, the, here's the, this crazy thing, is that Jesus communicated with the Father, and, and, and it'll blow you away, that God communicated with him. I know. Jesus spoke to the Father, and the Father spoke to Jesus. Can I just tell you, that's what prayer is. Look at this. That prayer occurs when you talk to God and then you listen to what he's saying to you. Probably the most simple definition of prayer that I could give you is just simply you talking to God, but then also shutting up long enough to listen to him, amen? I know, some of you are visiting Summit, welcome. <laughs> you see, I've said all summer, we were sitting there talking this last week as a staff and we were talking about where we're going this fall and teaching and that. And we, we got to thinking about this summer because this whole summer we've been talking about Holiday Road, vacation. And if you remember that very first week, I, I just told you that I know some of you are gonna go on vacation and we want you to. We want you to spend time with your family. But more important, we want you to spend time with God. And sometimes you have to vacate to, and to, to make room to spend time with God and his word. And in that second week, we talked about a time of Sabbath that God created us in a rhythm of Sabbath that he wants us to set a time aside every week that we are enjoying the Father. Isn't that an incredible statement that we get to enjoy the Father? And see, some of you grew up in a, in a group or a church or a denomination or a background that you didn't get to enjoy God. God was always mad at you and gonna strike you dead at any moment. And yet the truth is God loves you and he wants to spend time with you and actually he wants you to enjoy him Enjoy who he is. And then in week three, Jake talked about leading our family. And he talked about the integrity that David had and the integrity that came from him spending time with the father and David. And then week four, we talked about those expectations and lining up our expectations with the word. And Shane talked about hearing God's voice with all the noise of the world and, and getting into his word. And then last week, that fun message, if you heard it on purity, remember that? And here's the common denominator that we were setting down this last week and looking at. It's all summer long, here's what we want for you. We want you to enjoy the Father by spending time in his word and listening to his voice. And you see, sometimes you gotta take a holiday to do that. And sometimes you gotta take a vacation to do that. But what if that became a normal part of who we are? You see, today we're gonna wrap this series up and talking about prayer. And, and I'm gonna be honest with you. For some of us in this room, prayer's hard. And guys like me and maybe churches you grew up in and churches like I grew up in, we've made it hard. But the reality is prayer can be hard because I believe we have an enemy who does not want us to pray. That the enemy does not want us to get close to the Father. And he has convinced most of us that if we do pray, God won't answer them. And if he does, he's gonna shame and guilt you. And so in turn, what you do is you don't. That's why the apostle Paul said, labor with me. Labor with me. That word labor is such an interesting word for Paul to invite the church to labor with him in prayer. You see, prayer is something we must learn to do. And yet it's not hard when you really look at it. The problem is, like Leonard Ravenhill says, is that the self-satisfied do not want to pray. And the self-sufficient don't need to pray. And the self-righteous cannot pray. You see, the enemy knows that when we begin to talk to God and God talks to us, we begin to change and power comes. So yeah, it's hard. And the reason it's hard is because the enemy doesn't want us to be close to the Father. As we've talked about all summer long, I've also believed the reason prayer is so hard is because of how fast we run. If we've talked about anything this last summer, it says we live in a culture today that never stops. In fact, I was adding up the hours this last week outside of Kid Venture Live. Over 70 hours is what I put in this last week with weddings and all the stuff that we did. We run so hard that for so many of us, we never stop and check the gauges of our life. I drive an old Jeep, it's 30 something years old. We were driving down 2869 one day this last week and my kids were coming uh, to spend some time up here at the church to help Miss Ashley. As we were driving down the road, I kept smelling something burning. And finally one of my kids said, dad, do you smell that? And I was like, yes I do. And the whole time I'm looking at all my gauges on my Jeep, man, I'm just like, oh man. And I looked up and there's this old blazer in front of me. And I, was, I gotta be honest with you, I was coveting the blazer a little bit. I had to pray over that. It was old school. And I'm looking at that blazer and about the time I looked up after checking all my gauges, cause see, if I, if, if I don't check my gauges, that Jeep could be burning up. I've had one catch on fire back here before. 
And I looked up at that old blazer and I was like, man, that's such a good land. All of a sudden this white puff of smoke came out from under it. Looked like it was gonna blow up. And that was the smell. And I looked at my kids and said, it's gonna blow up. And they thought it meant fireball, like a you know, fireworks show. And, and I had to, anyway, it's just crazy. See, here's what happens. For many of us, we get checking the gauges of our car, but most of us never check the gauges of our heart because we're running so fast. You see, the scripture says to watch over. Everybody say, watch over. Watch scripture says to watch over. Our future and even our preservation of life today depends on whether or not we're looking at the gauges of our heart. And those things that come out, in fact, scripture calls on watchmen to watch over the city. If you read in the Old Testament and they lived in those walled cities, he's put, he said to put watchmen on the walls. And those watchmen were all, not only to be on that wall all night long, they were to sound the alarm if something was coming. If you fell asleep on the wall and you got attacked, then, then if you survived, you were gonna die anyway. This was a serious thing. And you see, all through Scripture, God is calling us to not only be watchmen on the wall, but to watch out for the people of God, to seek and watch out for the people around you. He even calls us to watch and be watchmen for the Lord's return. And most of us never think about that. Even as we take communion and we take communion longing for the Lord's return, many of us never connect that whole thing that God is coming back. And when he comes back, he's gonna take his elect up with him and we're gonna live for him forever in eternity. And he says to watch for that, to be on guard. You see, we're called to watch over our own life. In Proverbs 16, verse 17, look at it. It says the highway of the upright avoids evil. How do you do that? The one who guards or watches his way protects his life. You see, in order to stay on the right highway, that highway of knowing that your heart and the gauges and everything's right, is for us to be watchmen, to guard our life, to protect our life. As I was talking about last week, to make sure that we are securing the perimeters of our life so that when the weak Edward comes and the strong Edward's not there, there's no escape that Edward can run to. To watch our life, to guard it. You see, what's going on around you and in your life, many times, we'll bring out what's really what's in your heart. And it's very interesting to see what comes out when the pressure's on. It's very interesting to see that behavior when the wheels of your life start to fall off and your emotional gauges go crazy. And men and women respond to them differently. And the only antidote to this, the only antidote is to watch your steps daily. And prayer is one of the easiest antidotes for us to check the gauges of our life. As we talk to God and God talks to us, the problem is we've made it so stinking difficult. Danielle and I have been married 16 years and I don't, she was sitting down here, I don't know where she took off to, but um, we, we've been married 16 years and we've learned a whole lot about relationship. We've learned a whole lot about marriage and we've learned a whole lot about each other. We've been to counseling. We've been through re-engage, uh, what Paul was talking about and it blessed us to help us and we go to marriage counseling. I mean, I, let, let me just say this to you. Danielle and I, here's what we've learned about our fellowship. Because see, 16 years ago, we stood before a group of people about like this and we said, I do. We are committed to each other. But see, there's a difference in your commitment and your fellowship. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that our fellowship with each other is not driven by our commitment, but our fellowship is driven by our communication. I'm not talking about commitment. I'm talking about fellowship. That communication is marked by each of us, Danielle and I, talking to each other daily, not going weeks without talking, not even going five days without talking. And so let, let me give you a picture of what that looks like. Danielle and I, we, we sleep together. Amen, we're married, okay? Thank you for the one that said amen. Everybody else like, did he just say that? Yes, okay? Man, y'all gotta chill a little bit this morning, okay? We get up and we talk every morning. In fact, I woke up last night at midnight and didn't get back to sleep till about 4.30. My alarm went off at 5.45. So I wanted to talk to her all night and I knew better. Because I didn't want to wake her up. I thought, hey, if I'm up, everybody's going to be miserable, right? Amen? That's how self-centered I can be. See, every day we get up, and she either brings me coffee or I bring her coffee. And we'll spend some few minutes chatting, and then during the day, we'll text each other. We'll check in with each other. Even when she's at work, we'll text each other because she works in a cafeteria at the school and, and serves those kids and those ladies and, and sometimes sell services go through. So we'll send each other texts, and sometimes we just flirt. We'll just flirt with each other. 
And we have so much fun. And all day long we'll do that. And there's some days that we actually pick the phone up and call each other. And we'll visit with each other. Sometimes it's more, more than 30 seconds. Sometimes it's 10 seconds. But let me tell you what we do every night. Almost every night at 9 o'clock, we go out on our back porch and we talk to each other. And we listen to each other. You see, I think some of us forget that we're in a relationship with the Father. That God wants us to be in a relationship. He wants us to enjoy Him during the day. And I think some of you, you think, well, I got to get on my knees and pray and I got to close. I can't pray when I'm driving because I'll close my eyes. That's dangerous. When all along we don't understand or we have either forgotten that talking and listening is a valuable and essential part of a husband and wife, but it's also valuable and essential in our relationship with the Father. See, Danielle and I spend scheduled time together and that's where we talk about bills and kids and, and things like that. But then during the day, we might just walk along with each other and hold hands. We might meet at Red Rooster at 2.30 in the afternoon on Thursday. Just she and I and flirt. Just enjoy. And then we have that scheduled time every day where we got to handle some business and we got to do some things. And you see, prayer is nothing short of talking to God and listening to him. And listen, let me just say this before I go any further. Because in the back seats of, the, of these chairs, I want you to look in there and see if you can find one of these. I want everybody to grab one. Because I'm, I'm gonna teach you something very, very, very practical this morning. And some of you, as soon as you pick it up, you're gonna go, oh man, I've seen that. Listen, I learned this in 1986. I was at Super Summer at Baylor University as a student. And I remember when I was taught this, it taught me just a simple and practical way to pray. And I want to say this to some of you because now some of you picked it up and you're like, oh, I already know this. And you're checking out and thinking, I don't need, can I just say this to you? I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't need to brush up on their communication with God. I was praying with our prayer team this morning and one of them prayed something over me. And in that moment, God quickened my spirit. It wasn't anything new, but it's what I needed to hear in that moment. And I think for some of us in this room, you may, your prayer life may be phenomenal. But I think for many of us in this room, we don't even know how to pray. We're just throwing up Hail Marys. We're just throwing up, God, get me out of this. Protect me. There's a 15-year-old driver coming at me. Oh, God. And many of us don't know even how to carry on a conversation. And what I want to say to you is simple. It's sequential. It's specific. And I think it's spiritual. That we can take this model that we're going to walk through very quickly this morning, and then we're gonna go home. And you can take this model, maybe you're called to pray over the Thanksgiving turkey this year and you don't have to say the Pledge of Allegiance, amen? <laughs> you can even take this and modify it for that, or maybe you're called on to pray somewhere else and you've always got, no, 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 no. But maybe today you could walk out of here and take this card with you, put it in with your Bible, put it where you're having your quiet time. Remember last week we talked about spending time with God every day, just very practical time and a place. Take this card and put it with that. So at the end of your Bible study, the end of your time with God, the end of your time with reading the Word, that you can walk through this journey. Let's begin with the first one. Because see, it starts with the Word of God. And after you finished it, then you would take a few minutes to just adore God. Expressing your love and your adoration. Not so much on what God has done. We'll get to that in a minute. For just who He is. You see, I learned very quick when I was a pastor, when I started pastoring here, and we only had 40 people. I learned very quick that there were going to be some people that wanted to be around me just because of my title. And it was so refreshing to get around people that they didn't care that I was pastor. They didn't care I was your old youth pastor. They didn't care. They just wanted to be around me. Isn't that refreshing? And see, I think God's created us in His image. And when He looks at us, He wants to spend time with us, not for anything we've done, just because of who we are. And when we come to this time in prayer, we're adoring God just for who he is. My oldest daughter comes in our bedroom every night and I, I'm usually first in bed at my house about 8.30, amen? Can I get an amen? Yes, I see you yawning back there. You need to go to bed at 8.30, okay? Um, see, that's my friend. Um, I, every night she comes in our bedroom and she'll go kiss her mama and she comes around the end of the bed and she comes up beside me and she always lays her head right here. And I'll put my arm up around her and we sit there and she gives me a little kiss and I give her a little kiss. And then we hold hands and she walks off just to the last minute. 
and we let go. And I say, Livy, I'm proud of you. She goes, I know, Dad. Thank you. There's something, not, not what she does, because it doesn't matter if she and I just had a knockdown drag out. I've taken her door off her bedroom, and she's down to a bucket and a mattress. Amen? <laughs> Don't look at me that way. If you have kids, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but every night, we always, that's our thing. I'm proud of you. Not because of what you did today. Not because of your behavior. Just because of who you are. You see, when it comes to prayer, we focus on God's character first, his holiness, his mercy, his love. And listen, you don't know those things about him unless you're in the word. That's why I told you last week, you have gotta be in the word. If you're not spending time with God daily in his word and learning who he is, it's really hard. The reason I'm so proud of Olivia, number one, she's my blood. But number two, I spend an exorbitant amount of time with her because I love her. And yes, she drives me crazy. Yes, she's 13 redheaded and blue eyes. She's mine. And I know her. And that's why I can say things to her. And listen, when you get to know God through his word, you begin to adore him and worship him just because of who he is. Which moves us to confession. Because see, when you begin to realize God's holiness and his mercy and all those things, we realize, number one, that we are a sinner. Nobody in this room, in this room, absolutely is not a sinner. In fact, many of us, we judge other people, and really all judgment is is saying, you're more guilty than me. But the reality is we're all guilty, aren't we? Remember last week in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means all. That looked at your neighbor and say, that means you. Go ahead, look at them. Well, y'all enjoyed that a lot more last week. Some of you got way too much joy out of that. Some of you are scared this week because you got in trouble, didn't you? We're all sinners. You see, when you spend that time in prayer, the truth is we're reminded of how good God is. And see, confession has really two avenues. Number one, confession leads that we can do nothing without God. There's nothing. We are nothing. A confession of helplessness without him. A confession that we are inadequate and we need time of fellowship with him. In fact, look at John 15, verse five. Look what it says. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And see, confession is just saying, God, you are everything. I'm nothing. God, I don't have anything to offer. But the second part of that is the confession of sin. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, but if you confess your sin, he is faithful. Isn't that good? He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, let me stop here and say this. I'm not talking about your relationship with God. I'm talking about your fellowship with God. Because listen, at your commitment, when Jesus Christ became the Lord of your life, your past, your present, and your future sins were forgiven. I'm talking about fellowship. And see, this confession is basically taking the same view of sin that God does. That sin is deadly. Sin will kill us. And if we continue to play with sin, sin will absolutely destroy us. Confession means to be as, as concerned as God was about sin when he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. When we ask God to reveal, God, is there anything in my journey that's not pleasing to you? Is there an attitude that I need to correct? Let me go back to Danielle and I. See, Danielle and I, our commitment is solid, but our fellowship sometimes gets goofy. You ever been there? Where we'll kind of go through a day and, and we'll get to the end of the day and we'll finally look at each other going, have I done something? Have I done something? Because I just feel, the, I feel a distance. And sometimes she'll look at me and go, yeah, you hurt my feelings about 30 minutes ago. You hurt my feelings this morning. You were a jerk. Because we talk to each other that way. And sometimes she'll come to me and she'll, I just feel distant. Are you, are you okay? Have I done something? See, I'm not talking about, really, we're married. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fellowship. To where she and I come together and sometimes I have to ask her to forgive me. And sometimes she has to ask me to forgive her. And it's in that moment that fellowship is restored. And sometimes we're just good. We're just struggling. 
Because that's relationship. It's just doing life. So there's this thing of confession and adoration. And thirdly, this thing of thanksgiving. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. It says, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. See, thanksgiving is different than adoration because adoration is really talking about who God is, where thanksgiving is talking about what God has done. And by the way, do you know that God is at work in your life every day? He's at work in your life every day. Sometimes I forget that. In fact, I'll be honest with you, a couple of weeks ago, I came home from youth camp and I'd had my dose of religion that week. And I hate religion. Y'all have heard me say this before. I, people that tell me they have everything figured out about God just drive me crazy. And I'd had enough of that this week. And I came home from youth camp. My air conditioner went out at my house. Then we're displaced for two days. I get home from that and, and, and my dryer quits working. So I came home and I had to take our dryer apart. And it's like one thing after another thing. But as we were leaving the house that Sunday, we were pulling out and a real good friend of mine had just come home from Crucible, a men's retreat. And we were all loading up in the car because it was too hot to stay in the house. And he pulls up and he stepped out of his big old truck and he walked up to me and he didn't say a word. He just grabbed me and held me. Two grown men standing in my driveway. And all he said in his tears and crying, he was crying, I was crying. And all he said was, I love you and thank you. I love you and thank you. For three minutes, I love you and thank you. He turned around, got in his truck and left. <laughs> three days later, I'm sitting in my office and I get an email. It's from a guy named Jeff Goff. I was like, who is this? He said, hey, thank you. You wrote me a letter 10 years ago and I was cleaning out my files today and I came across that letter. I was like, who is this? I scanned down, he scanned the letter in and sent it to me. I don't even remember writing it. It was on our old letterhead. That's how long ago this was. And I read the letter and went, that's pretty good. I was like, I wrote that? And I sat there for a few minutes going, this is good. There's something about being told thank you, isn't there? I don't know how many times I've been told by waitresses and waiters, Thank you for saying thank you. Isn't that amazing? That a waitress or a waiter would say, thank you for saying thank you. That's why we teach our kids to say thank you. Because there's something about it. Listen, God loves you. And he's moving in your life every day. Whether you see it or not, whether you stop long enough to check the gauges of your heart, God is moving. See, when the air conditioner was going out, when all the relational issues we were dealing with as elders that week, and, and I'd had it up to here with religion, and I was already tired. I'd been to youth camp. I'm not as young as I used to be, amen. And I was done. All along, God was coming along and saying, I love you. I'm at work in you. Don't give up, son. I love you. Do you know God's doing that in your journey too? And sometimes it's as big as somebody pulling in your driveway and doing what happened to me. Sometimes it's an email, but other times it's just simply that God is meeting your needs. See, he's always acting in the life of his kids. Take time to offer him thanks. Thank him for air conditioner. Can I get an amen the last two weeks? Amen. <laughs> Thank him for food, for a bed. Thank him for legs. You know, I said this in the first service because <laughs> when we go to Walmart, Danielle will always tell me, hey, park out away, way away. I'm like, baby, our car has already got door dings. She goes, no, 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 be grateful you have legs. Really? <laughs> okay, so I drive out to the gas pumps and we park and we walk to Walmart, amen? So convicting because there's nothing wrong with me. I mean, yeah, I need to lose some weight. When's the last time you just stopped and said, thank you, God, to discipline yourself? How about every day that you adore him and you can make that confession and then just to be thankful? And then lastly is supplication. Because I know what some of you are thinking. Well, when do I get to my stuff, right? Because that's how we think, isn't it? When do I get to my stuff? Well, here you go. After you've adored him and you've confessed and realized you can't do it without him and you've been grateful, then you come to this part of supplication. And it's really two parts because supplication is, there's a surrendering part. 
There's a surrendering part, offering your mind, your will, and your emotions, your spirit, your attitudes to him. It's during this time that maybe you do put those requests that deal with you. But then the second part of that is intercession, where you get to pray for others, where you get to lift up. I get an email list every Tuesday morning before we go to staff meeting of all the prayers that are turned in here that we get to pray over, that I get to pray over you, that I get an insight of what's going on in our community that I get to pray for. And you see, I think for some of us, we want to jump to that before we get to the rest. So see, here's what I want to do for you. I just want to say this. Maybe you would take this home and use this as a simple way to remind you to spend time with God. Prayer is simply talking to God and God talking to you. You listening and Him listening. To take it home, to devote, devote yourself to prayer. See, here's what I want for you. I gotta be honest with you. There's a lot I want for you, but probably the biggest thing I want for you is to know Jesus, to be in a relationship with him, to experience the power of knowing him and being in a relationship with him. That, I want that for you. And I can't open your head and pour it in. If I could, I would. That'd be a little weird. The only way that happens is you spending time in God's word and listening to it and listen to it. I wanna close with a couple of passages and we're going home. Isaiah 62, look at this. It says, I posted watchmen on the walls. There's that word again in Jerusalem. And God's talking to the people of Jerusalem and what he's wanting them to do. And he says this, they'll never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him, talking about the Lord, no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Now, I want you to look what he's saying. Here's what he says. Look at the text. He says, give me no rest. Don't stop asking me. Don't stop petitioning me. Don't stop begging me until Jerusalem is established. So here's what I'd say to you. Pester God. Pestering. Because that's what he's saying. Pestering. Go hard after him. Here's what God's saying. Bother me. Come on. Keep knocking. Keep knocking. You see, God's not like me because when my kids pester me, it doesn't turn out well. Amen? Amen? And I'm so glad that he's the heavenly father that I can, that I, one of these days I'll be just like him. And yet here's what he's saying to us. Don't stop knocking. Pester me. Your marriage about the end, don't go anywhere. Don't bail out. Pester God. Go on bother him. Stay on it until he changes you or changes them. Amen? Pestering. Look at James 4, two through three. You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You argue. You do not have because you do not ask God. See, the reason some of you don't have is you didn't ask him. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasure. See, some of us, our prayers are all about us. God, I need a Corvette. Anybody else need a Corvette? Or am I alone in that? You know why I don't have a Corvette? Because I would absolutely be hell on wheels. I would. I'd drive the snot out of the thing. And it'd be all about me. I'd roll the windows down so you could see me. Amen? Amen? And I've tried to justify it. Oh, Lord, that would help me minister and evangelize. In fact, I'll put on the plates, preacher. <laughs> See, some of you don't have because you're asking with the wrong motives. But listen to me. Some of you don't have because you hadn't asked. And, and, and let me say this. You don't have because you do not ask. It's not an implication that if you did ask, you would have. Because see, God's either going to say yes, no, or wait. And when he says yes, be obedient. Act on it. If he says no, then understand this, your motives are impure or God's protecting you. He's protecting you. But listen to me, if he says wait, and then sometimes that comes as silence, then I would say this, if there's no sin, heaven's not closed. Get ready, because he's preparing you. He's preparing you. I remember telling my dad one time, when I went through all that season 20 years ago, and dad kept telling me, son, God's getting you ready. God's getting you ready. And I told him one day, I said, I'm tired of getting ready. I'm ready for something to happen. And 20 years later, 
I'm so glad God prepared me. Who could ever dream or imagine we'd be sitting in the middle of a cow pasture, reaching the people, giving away the food, loving kids, that we get to be a part of today. See, if there's no known sin, then get ready. God's preparing you for greatness. If there's sin, let's get that right. It's what we talked about last week. So let me close with this and we'll go home. This last passage in Luke says, so I say to you, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Notice these words, ask, seek, and knock. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open to you. Now listen to me, here's, here's what he's saying. I want to spend time with you. So ask, knock. I want that. And that's God saying that to you. He wants a relationship with you. And for some of you, the reason your prayers aren't answered is because you don't know God. And whoever you're praying to, the reality is you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. For the rest of us in this room that know him, examine yourselves and see if there's sin. If there's not, then get ready. He's preparing you and it's gonna be good. Amen? Let me pray for you. So Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I pray today, Lord, that there's somebody here that does not know you. God, they realize their prayers are not being answered, not because they're not spiritual or anything. They just don't know you. They've never come to a time in their life where they've admitted their sin. They've confessed it and they've repented and they've invited you to be the Lord of their life. And God, if there's somebody here this morning, teenager, adult, that's never given their life to you, God, I pray that in this moment right now, they would admit they're a sinner. They would confess their sin. And God, they would surrender their life to you. And God, give them courage to do that. For those of us in this room that's never prayed, because we don't know how. God, I pray we'd take this card and we'd lay it on our desk. We'd lay it on our nightstand. We'd lay it on our kitchen table. Maybe put it on our fridge or on our mirror. And God, we begin a relationship with you. And you'd change us. Us talking to you. You talking to us. You listen to us and us listen to you. So God, give us courage. I love you. And I thank you for Jesus. And it's in his beautiful name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.